Welcome to our morning service at First Christian Reformed Church of Montreal. If you're joining us for the first time, thank you for being with us. If you'd like to find out more about us at First CRC, you can check out our website at www.montrealcrc.org or you can visit us on Facebook. We're beginning our worship service with two suggested songs. Lord, you hear the cry, Lord, have mercy, and speak, O Lord. You can find links to the words and music for each of these songs in the comments posted below this video. We're called to worship this morning with these words taken from Psalm 72. Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to the king's son. May he judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. May the mountains yield prosperity for the people and the hills in righteousness. May he defend the cause of the poor of the people, give deliverance to the needy, and crush the oppressor. May he live while the sun endures and as long as the moon throughout all generations. Our God himself greets us with these words, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. We cannot come before God unless we are first honest with ourselves about who we are, about the mistakes we make, and about how well or poorly we care for others. In this spirit, let us offer our prayers to God. Let us pray. God, you placed us in the world to be its salt. We are afraid of committing ourselves, afraid of being stained by the world. We do not want to hear what they might have to say, and our salt dissolves as if in water. Forgive us, Jesus. God, you placed us in the world to be its light. We are afraid of the shadows, afraid of poverty. We do not want to know other people's struggles, and our light slowly fades away. Forgive us, Jesus. God, you placed us in the world to live in community. Thus, you taught us to love, to share in life, to struggle for bread and justice, your truth incarnate in our life. So be it, Jesus. Amen. The God who challenges us is also the God who encourages us. The God who confronts us is also the God who accepts us. Be assured that God is with us even now, accepting, guiding, and forgiving. Thanks be to God. God calls us to again live for him. For those who put their faith in Jesus Christ, we are no longer trying to make ourselves good enough for him. But through the words of the law, Christ helps us to see what we already are in him. God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Our Lord Jesus himself said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. We're starting a new series this week at First CRC on justice and mercy. 
And we begin by looking at Psalm 33, Psalm 33. Before we read these words together, let us ask for God to open our ears, our minds, and our hearts to receive them. God of all truth, fill us again with your spirit as we turn to your word. Open our minds so that we understand what you have to say to us. Free us from our selfishness so that we are ready to obey. Open our lips and fill our mouths with your praise. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 33. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make music to him on the ten-string lyre. Sing to him a new song, play skillfully and shout for joy. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea into jars, he puts the deep into storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord, let all the people of the world revere him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. The Lord foils the plans of the nations, he thwarts the purposes of the peoples. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever, the purposes of his heart through all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. From heaven the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place he watches all who live on earth, he who forms the hearts of all, who considers everything they do. No king is saved by the signs of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance, despite all its great strength it cannot save. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love, to deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Brothers and sisters in Christ, since the COVID-19 outbreak began, I've noticed how certain key words have been coming up more in conversation and on the news than they used to, particularly words like isolate and quarantine and essential services as opposed to those services now deemed non-essential. But then there's this one word that seems to keep coming up more and more too, and that word is uncertainty. Uncertainty. Of course, even at the best of times, there's always a certain measure of uncertainty. We can make all the plans we want. We can say, for instance, well, I'm hoping to get this project done next week. We're hoping to go on vacation this summer, and so on and so forth. But it doesn't take much for something to come up and throw all our plans into disarray. Uncertainty is not anything new. It's always been there. But that lingering sense of uncertainty that always has seemed to be there, it, it does seem to be especially acute, especially right now. We find ourselves thinking, you know, when, when will our kids finally be able to go back to school? When are we going to be able to go back to work? Will we be able to go on vacation this summer like we planned? And, and especially that last one, to be honest, I hope so. It would be nice to get back to normal sometime soon. But the reality is that we just don't know. Things are just so uncertain. Even for us as a church family, some of the members of our church council, along with some members of our, our key committees and also some other ministry leaders, we had an online meeting this past week. We talked about how the past year went, what was good, what would we like to do better next time. It was really encouraging. But then we also took some time to talk about what we hope to do next. 
Can we even continue some of our ministries until things get back to normal? A lot of us are are hoping that we can at least start most of our ministries again in the fall, but the reality is that at this point, we just don't know. Things are just so unclear, so uncertain right now, it's, it's hard to make plans. And so, for that reason, because of just how much uncertainty there seems to be out there, it is kind of reassuring to hear what it says in Psalm 33. Even when everything else seems to be unsteady, insecure, it's good to know the word of the Lord is still right and true. Especially when we honestly don't know what's going to happen, it's good to be reminded that the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purposes of his heart continue through all generations. Now, the funny thing is that there is actually a lot of uncertainty about this particular psalm, Psalm 33. It's one of the few psalms that doesn't have an inscription, so we really don't know who wrote it. And that makes it hard to say when was it written, what occasion was it written for. It does seem fairly safe to assume that it was written as a song, that it was meant to be sung by God's people, by the people of Israel, when they gathered together to worship God at the temple in Jerusalem. You see that in the opening line of Psalm 33, where it says, Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. This psalm starts off with this call, this invitation to praise God. Praise him with the harp. Make music to him on the ten-string lyre. Sing a new song to him. In other words, give him praise because of the new things he has done. And then after that, what we get in the rest of Psalm 33 is really a list, a fairly comprehensive list, of reasons to give God praise. Now, just to be clear, this psalm is not one of those acrostic poems. It's not one of those songs where each verse starts with the next letter of the alphabet. But the fact that this psalm does have exactly 22 verses, which is the same number of verses as there are letters in the Hebrew alphabet, 22, that suggests this psalm was still meant to be a kind of ABCs of reasons to give God praise. And the biggest reason. The most important reason to give God praise comes up in verses 4 and 5, where it says, For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. In other words, you can count on Israel's God. You can depend on him. What God says is always reliable. When you look at the world around you, when you look at nature, you can see how he takes good care of everything. God makes sure everything is just the way it's supposed to be. The psalmist then follows up on that. He, or maybe she, they go on to explain why God's word can be trusted and why it is that when you look at the world around us, there is evidence of God's loving care. That's because God is the one who made everything. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. And not only did God make everything, it all remains under his sovereign power. Even the most chaotic forces of nature remain under God's control. He gathers the waters of the sea into jars. He puts the deep into storehouses. And as the psalmist points out, that same sovereign power that God exercises over the forces of nature, that same sovereign power is also active in human affairs. The nations of the earth, they might think that they're free to do whatever they want, that they're not accountable to anyone. But God foils their plans. He thwarts the purposes of the people. But God's purposes, his purposes always prevail. What God determines to do always goes ahead as planned. Now, that might all sound well and good. As I said before, there is something reassuring about that, about this idea that no matter what, God's word is right and true. It's reassuring to know that the God who made everything and who continues to rule over all things also loves righteousness and justice. The trouble is that it's not always easy to believe that. To be honest, a lot of what Psalm 33 says about God and his justice, it raises some pretty big questions for some people. 
For instance, when you do look at the world around us, when you look at nature, it can be hard sometimes to believe that everything's been ordered and arranged perfectly. Like, really? This, this virus that's been wreaking havoc right now? You're saying God has that under control? Really? And when you look at human society, at human culture, it can be even harder to believe that God loves righteousness and justice. There doesn't always seem to be much evidence that the earth is full of his unfailing love. But then a lot of people also have trouble with this idea that God foils the plans of the nations, that he thwarts the purposes of the people. I mean, who does God think he is telling us what to do all the time? How come God gets to always have things his way? What about us? What about me? What about what I want? It doesn't always seem fair, does it? Of course, part of the problem is that we're not very comfortable with the idea that, that God is sovereign, that he rules over all. We're not always comfortable with the idea that, that God is great and we are not, not compared to him. But that is how things work. If God is great, if God is the Almighty, if he is the all-powerful, if he is the sovereign Lord over all, then we can't be, can we? There isn't really room for two almighties, is there? And the thing is, too, even if we are able to accept that, even if we're able to somehow come to terms with the fact that God is great and we are not, we still don't like it. It's not something that just naturally makes us want to burst out into songs of joy. Oh, sing praise to God because he is great and I'm not. You think of what most people do when they run into someone who has authority, who has power over them, and they don't like it. What happens is we get nervous. We get really quiet. That's basically what happens, for instance, every time I have to cross the border between Canada and the U.S. and deal with customs. I make a point of saying as little as possible. It's not that I'm doing anything wrong, but I still don't want any trouble because in that particular situation, they have the power. I don't. Of course, it wasn't supposed to be that way. It wasn't supposed to be like that between us and God. As we've seen before, God created us. He created us for himself. God created us to be his people. God made us to live in fellowship, in relationship with him. But then, because of sin, and not just because of the sin and misery and injustice in the world around us, but because of the sin that has taken root in us, that has taken root in our very hearts. Because of sin, that relationship with God was broken. And so we no longer see God's power. We no longer see his greatness as a good thing, even though we're not the ones who made everything, even though we don't really see the big picture. We have this tendency to want things our way, not his. Because of sin, we're no longer willing to trust God. We're no longer willing to trust his plans for us. But that, that's why it's important for us to pay attention to this shift in focus that takes place in the middle of Psalm 33, starting at verse 12. In verse 12, the psalmist says, Blessed is the nation, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Now, up to this point, the focus has been on God, on God and his sovereignty. The focus has been on God and his great power and might and wisdom. But now the psalmist starts talking about what does this mean for us, especially if we're willing to put our trust in God, if we're willing to put our trust in his plans for us. Just because things aren't right, just because things aren't good between God and us, that doesn't change the fact that not only is God great, but he is also good. And so there is this contrast that comes out in verse 12. We saw in verse 10 how God, God foils the plans of the nations. When people try to go ahead and do their own thing, regardless of what God wants, God has this way of stepping in and putting a stop to their schemes. But things turn out very differently for those whom God has chosen to be his own. Blessed is the nation who has the Lord as their God. 
In other words, things go differently for those who recognize that they belong to God. Things go differently for those who identify themselves with God and with his plans. They experience God's blessing. They experience his peace, his shalom. But then before anyone jumps to the conclusion that Psalm 33 is talking about just one nation, about one people in particular, the psalmist goes on to describe how the Lord looks down from heaven and sees, he sees everyone, all humankind. God watches over all those who live on earth. And so God refuses to be limited by our political or ideological divisions. God's plans to have a people for himself are not going to be stopped by some random lines that we drew on a map. Mind you, this idea that God is looking down on us from on high, that he's watching us all the time, that, that might make us uncomfortable too especially in this high-tech age we live in where it seems that we're being watched all the time and who knows who's trying to steal our personal information. It almost makes it sound as if God is spying on us, that he's, he has us under surveillance or something. The reality, of course, is that if God is the one who made everything, if he is the one who created all things, including us, then he already knows all there is to know about us. He is the one who forms the hearts of all. He is already aware of everything they do. And so really what the psalmist is saying is that even though God is the sovereign Lord over all the earth, even though he rules over all things, he isn't necessarily out there directing and micromanaging every little thing we do. Somehow in his greatness and his goodness, God is able to control everything that happens. But he still gives us space. He still gives us freedom even freedom to get ourselves into trouble. But then, because of how God is always watching over his people, he is also the God who comes and rescues them. He is the God who delivers his people even from death. And that's why it doesn't make any sense to depend entirely on human leaders, to put our trust in kings and warriors, to expect them to, to try and make things right in this fallen, sinful world. And that's why you shouldn't put all your hope in human resources, whether it's armies or horses, and expect them to establish justice. They can't. They can't. But God can God is able to make things right. God is able to bring about justice even in this fallen world. He can, and he does. So then, what does all that mean for us? Psalm 33 makes it clear that God is great. His plans stand firm forever. But he's also good. He is the God who watches over his people. So are we, are we willing to wait for God? Are we willing to wait in hope for him? Because waiting for God, waiting for his plans, for his purposes, that also means admitting that his plans are better than our plans. It means that we need to bring our plans, our hopes and desires in line with what God has in mind for us. And yet we have an active role to play in God's plans too. We're not just puppets. We're not just pawns. The God who created heaven and earth and who continues to rule over them, he is also the God who sent his own son to us. In Jesus Christ, we see God's greatness in action, overcoming disease, commanding the forces of nature, defying even death itself. And at the same time, Jesus also shows us God's goodness, forgiving sins, suffering and dying so that we could be right with God once again, promising to be with us always, even to the end of the age. And when you look at how Psalm 33 begins and ends, it begins and ends with praise. And so as God's people, we are, we are to proclaim who God is. We are to let people know what God has done. We have experienced his deliverance. We've experienced his salvation. And that's basically what witnessing, that's what sharing your testimony is, is really all about. It is simply telling people, this, this is what God has done for me. But then what happens as people hear that, when they hear about what God has done for us, it helps them to see it. Hearing about what God has done helps people to start seeing things 
differently. A few years ago now, my family and I, we were watching this Tim Allen movie, The Santa Claus. And there's this one scene in the movie where Tim Allen's character is at Santa's workshop up at the North Pole. He's surrounded by toys and elves and reindeer, and he's looking at everything. But as he's looking, he keeps saying again and again, I'm seeing it, but I don't believe it. I'm seeing it, but I don't, I just don't believe it. But then one of Santa's helpers, one of the elves, says to Tim Allen's character, you're missing the point. Seeing isn't believing. Believing is seeing. Kids don't have to see this place to know that it's here. They just know. Whether you still believe in Santa or not, what they said in that movie struck me. It's kind of how it works with us and with God's plans. There are times when it can be really tough to see any evidence of God's justice and righteousness in this world. But what we believe about God and his plans, that changes the way we see. It changes the way we see him and it also changes the way we see his plans unfolding in the world around us. And all God's people said, Amen. As we continue our worship together, let's spend a few moments in silent reflection. We have a few questions to help guide your thinking. How comfortable are we with the idea that God is in control of everything that happens? How is there comfort in knowing that I am not my own, but belong to him? The Bible talks again and again about how God is great, but also that he is good. Why is it so important that we take both of those truths to heart? Let's come before our God in prayer. Lord God, Father in heaven, Maybe the reason we're here today is because there is so much that is uncertain right now. Some of us, we don't know what is going to happen to the rest of our school year. Some of us, we aren't sure what's going to happen to our jobs. We don't know what's going to happen to our savings. Some of us, we're worried about loved ones, especially those who are in the hospital or living in long-term care facilities. We don't know what's going to happen to them. And so maybe that's why, at least part of the reason, why we're here today, Father. We're here because we're hoping that by taking part in a church service, or, or maybe as we listen to your word, we'll find something solid, we'll, we'll find something familiar, something that, that still makes sense. Whatever our reasons are for being here, Father, help us to find you. Help us to again, or maybe even for the first time, Help us to experience something of your greatness, something of your power. Help us to see through the seeming chaos and confusion around us that you are still in control of everything that happens. But also help us, Father, to see, help us to experience something of your goodness. Help us to experience something of your power to bring healing and reconciliation. Help us to know that the hands that shaped and formed the heavens and the earth are the same hands that were stretched out on the cross so that our sins might be forgiven. And help us to feel the comfort that comes from knowing those same hands will never, ever let us go. Help us, Lord, to know the power, the truth, that nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God that is ours in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Father, help us to not keep that love to ourselves. Our communities, the people around us, they desperately need that love right now, especially. And so we lift up those, Lord, who are are doing so much for our safety, for our well-being. We pray for everyone working at hospitals and health clinics. We pray for those working in long-term care facilities and in group homes. 
We pray for those who are still busy patrolling our streets and stocking grocery store shelves and keeping essential goods moving across the country and around the world. We pray for our leaders, Lord, that they would get the best possible advice and support and information. May they get all that they need to make the best decisions possible. And we pray for your churches, Lord. May we be faithful in serving others and reaching out to those in need. And may we, may we be faithful in sharing your love with those who need to experience it. All this we bring to you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Giving is part of our worship here at First CRC. It's part of how we show the love of God by reaching out to other people. Now, if you're just joining us online, there's no expectation that you have to give anything. But if you are part of the church family here at First CRC, this is a way that we can together give thanks to God and help in the work of his church. Our offerings this week are for our own ministries here at First CRC and for the work of Mission Montreal. For more information on how to give, especially if you want to give online, you can contact us by going to our church website or visiting our Facebook page. God sends us out into his world to carry on his work with his blessing. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. We'll be ending our worship service this morning with two more suggested songs, 10,000 Reasons and all creatures of our God and King. You can find videos with music and words for both of these songs included in the comments below. Until next time, God bless.